When I was a child, I got chased by a warthog. This was no Pumbaa, you know, the cuddly, if smelly, singing warthog from The Lion King. This creature was fast, relentless, and almost as tall as I was. I was on holiday in Botswana, and we were staying in the famous Chobe National Park. As I walked outside the hotel in the afternoon sun, my family was waiting by the car to go on a game drive. I was met by a mama warthog and all her babies in tow grazing right in front of the car park. Surprised by my sudden presence, they started chasing me. She was quick. Even her babies were quick. I didn't think to stop at all. I just ran and I kept running, but so did the warthog and so did her piglets. My family was nowhere to be seen. I was all alone. It seemed to last forever. But eventually, I reached the closest door I could find, the hotel reception. The very next day, I was back enjoying the wildlife and the landscape. Being chased by a warthog didn't stop me but it did make me more aware of my place in the natural world. I'm Rutendo Shackleton. And I'm Sebastian Echeverri. And this is the BBC Earth Podcast. In this episode, we're talking about safari. Nature Instagrammer Lucy Lapwing explores a temperate rainforest in Scotland. Rutendo and I go searching for spiders using a surprising household device. And we track down elusive wolf howls in Portugal. Okay, Tendo, be real with me here. You've worked with and encountered a lot of famously fearsome animals but you're telling me the one that stands out from all of those is this warthog? I was just a kid, so (laughs) it was quite fearsome at the time. (laughs) Your parents, how did they react? They were nowhere to be seen. And then when I found them, they were like, where have you been? Like, we've been waiting for you. And I was like, oh my goodness, you have no idea what just happened to me. But yeah, we spent so much of my childhood getting out and exploring the natural world. And so it never really deterred us. It was almost like, a, oh, you know, what will happen next time we're out? Though, I mean, like I'm listening to this and me and maybe other people are thinking, these are awesome stories, right? You're out in the wilderness all the time. But, you know, I grew up in New York City and a lot of people around the world are living in like apartment blocks, you know, major cities and feel like, oh, I can't go out to safari, what would you say to them? Yeah, so maybe we should talk about what we mean by when we say safari. Yeah, for me, I hear safari and I think rich tourists, land rovers, driving out to like Mm -hmm. photograph a rhino or something that may or may not have been like set up for them to come see. That's actually not what we're talking about in this episode. We are talking about creating your own adventure outside, seeing what you can find and enjoying that and appreciating that. I mean, Sebastian, did you recently find something interesting on the rooftop of the BBC building? (laughs) Yeah, that is true. We, We had a little break, so I wandered up. And there were some potted plants and a little, like, rooftop greenery. And I found a jumping spider. The zebra jumping spider. Cute, tiny little spider, like, maybe like a centimeter long, its whole body. He's got these, like, short, stocky legs and the big puppy dog eyes of jumping spiders uh, with these black and white stripes. I love that you say puppy dog eyes. (laughs) I don't know how else to describe them. That's their trademark. They've got these big adorable eyes that take up almost their whole head that you just could get lost staring into. (laughs) And then I brought it back to the studio and everyone kind of had a blast looking at it. It was a prime example that nature is everywhere and it's just there for us to appreciate and to enjoy. 
someone else who loves to explore the nature on their doorstep is friend of the podcast, Lucy Lapwing, who some listeners might know from her beautiful Instagram posts. Last spring, we sent Lucy out to record in the temperate rainforest near her home on the Isle of Butte in Scotland. In a bit of woodland I've come for a little bumble around today is Atlantic temperate rainforest. Mostly oak trees here and every single wooded surface I can see is absolutely dripping in lichen and mosses and epiphytes which is a nerdy word for plants that grow in plants. <laughs> Various types of ferns. Yeah I'm coming for a, a wander around today and basically following my recipe for a nature nerd day out. Pick somewhere nice to walk, walk around and see what I find. Be it tiny things, be it big things, feathered things, green things, scuttling things, whatever I can clap my eyes on. I don't know if you can hear away in the background there, there's a gorgeous song thrush singing. They like to pick a phrase and then they'll repeat it three, four, maybe five times, get bored of it and then they'll move on to the next. Sounds like loads of different birds mashed into one doing some kind of remix. I love it. You might be able to hear how squidgy it is underfoot. And that is because that is a key feature of this special type of rainforest. It's got to be wet. These places only grow in areas of really, really high rainfall and really high moisture content. That's what all of these mosses and lichens need. And very clean air. This isn't the type of woodland you see often. It's very much mostly isolated to the west coast in the UK where we get this really really wet weather and in areas where there's low atmospheric pollution so all of these lichens a lot of them are that kind of really difficult green to describe kind of turquoise kind of pale green and a lot of those are what we call usnea lichens various different species of usnea which is a really nice word to say all different types of structures and shapes and they're adorning the trees around me the air is so fresh and clean. It's absolutely delicious on the nostrils. So I'm gonna have a bit of a, a gander around and, and see what I can find. I'm gonna be prodding in various damp places. Ooh, <laughs> and uh, having a look amongst the treetops, seeing what feathered creatures I can find. And hopefully taking you on a little bit of an adventure around this really quite special bit of woodland. This is absolute bliss. I'm just watching a common carder bee feeding from bluebells and the scent is wafting up my nose. It's just the most gorgeous, sweet smell. I wish I could transmit it through the microphone. And behind me I'm being serenaded by a cuckoo. And it's quite a cloudy morning, but it's beautiful. It's so moody, atmospheric. Absolutely gorgeous, moist, wet spring morning where you can just feel everything come into life. Now in this particularly damp patch next to um, a very rotten log. Ooh, in fact touching it now it's so rotten that the wood's like soft, it's beautiful. But next to that is this amazing patch of sphagnum moss. I think this is sphagnum, I'm going to say phallax, which is quite a common one. Really, really bright green sphagnum moss. And if you don't know much about sphagnum, first of all, the main thing you've got to know is it's really satisfying to say sphagnum. Sphagnum. Um, the second thing is that these are just one of the most important plants in the UK. Now we've got about 32 different types of sphagnum moss in the UK and they come in all different shapes and sizes and particularly colours. The ones in front of me are bright bright green, like lime green and they're just so satisfying. The way they grow in clumps there's like these, oh hello, we have a raven. So they grow in these satisfying clumps all together. It's kind of like an intricate repeated pattern, all these little bobbles and bumps. And they've got these tiny little branches threading off them. You can pick one up and they're, they're not properly rooted. They kind of grow semi-suspended. And sphagnum mosses 
build their own environment. They're ecosystem engineers of a sort in that they need that moisture and they act like giant sponges. So they've actually been used in the past for things like nappy fillings and wound dressings. They hold so much water. It's several times their own weight in water that they can hold. If you pick up a handful of particularly wet sphagnum and squeeze it, loads of water will drip out. And so it self-perpetuates. Over time, it gathers more and more moisture, which means more and more sphagnum can grow. So I've just spotted one of my absolute favourite woodland birds scooting up a tree. They're just joyful and hilarious to watch. The tree creeper, I mean, it does what it says on the tin. They live in the UK year round, they don't migrate. Gorgeous, tiny little things. They look kind of like a little mouse with like a banana shaped black beak. They're just really quite ridiculous looking, these gorgeous little brown birds. And they creep up trees. They'll start at the bottom and work their way up, scuttling, really kind of flattened against the tree trunk all the way up, rooting for little creepy crawlies and invertebrates to scoff. And it's amazing, they use their little long tail trailed out behind them like, um, like a wedge. It's kind of something to lean back on as they hoik their way up the tree trunk. If you think about it, it's kind of like us climbing a massive cliff face, trying to find our lunch as we go. <laughs> and they have this absolutely gorgeous little song as they go along. It's really quite funny and I think it suits them because it's almost comedic. It's got a little at the end. She's a gorgeous noise to listen to. It's a really, really high pitched one, so it's one of the first bird songs that you actually really sadly lose as you get older and you stop being able to pick up those higher frequencies. So I'm going to try and spend as much time as possible just clinging onto that sound because it's just utterly joyful. So this is kind of my modus operandi. I've come to a place just for a walk, not with any particular goal in mind. I like to have a little bit of a nature wander, a little bit of a nerd session and just see what I can find, see who turns up on the day, who I get to meet. Whether it's a bug or a wildflower or a bird, you never know what you're going to find on a nature walk. I felt like I was right there with Lucy in the temperate rainforest. It reminded me a lot of like when I go hiking. Mm -hmm. I might have plans of like, oh, I'm going to go on this trail that's like a mile or two long. But I never make it that far because every few steps I'm finding a cool bug to look at. Or like, oh, there's a bunch of logs to flip over. Like, I'll be there all day and move 10 meters or something in an hour. I absolutely love doing the same thing, especially when I'm on my dog walks. Mm -hmm. um, because we go to the forest near our house and there's always something new to look at. And I noticed that Chilo started like licking the plants. Mm -hmm. And I also noticed that he likes licking these big bubbles that are on the plants as well. Just taking all the moisture in. Is it like a big ball of white bubbly foam? Mm -hmm. I think that might actually be an animal making that. <gasps> are you serious? So there are these really cool insects called leaf hoppers and tree hoppers. And one of the ways that they survive is that they make these big bubble houses to sleep inside of so that they're no safe. No way. Uh, so they literally, it's just like bubbles of spit until it makes like a giant ball. And then in the center of that, there will be a, a leaf hopper or a tree hopper just napping. Are you telling me that my dog is licking bubbles of spit <laughs> off of plants? Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, goodness. I'm sorry. He might also be eating some tree hoppers that were less well defended than they thought they were. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I don't know whether to be grossed out or feel bad. <laughs> well, now I know something else. So I'm going to have to take my magnifying glass and see if I can see any sleeping tree hoppers in the middle of those bubbles. Some of them are really colorful. There's one around here that's neon blue and like maroon. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. A while back, Sebastian and I went on our own mini safari in Bristol, home of the BBC Natural History Unit, and where they make all the wonderful David Attenborough documentaries. 
We went looking for bats in a cemetery, more on that in a future episode, and we tried to find a pair of nesting peregrines, though sadly they were away from their nest. But we did have more luck later on when we went searching for spiders. So we're at the center of Brandon Hill Park in Bristol. We're hunting for spiders. This is my first time spidering. It's and like bird watching, but for spiders. <laughs> and we're by this, the tower wall, which is got lots of plants growing up and down and around it and through it. So am I correct in saying that this is a really good place to go spidering? So the secret about spidering is that almost everywhere is a good place to go spidering. Cool. Spiders live all across the world but this is a really good place for the spider that we're looking for. So today we're trying to find a tube web spider. This is a non-native spider. So it's not originally from the UK, but the Mediterranean. Oh, right. Um, and they're called tube web spiders because they like to build these long tunnels where they live in gaps in walls and rocky debris. And so the, the, the crumbling stone here is an excellent habitat for them and I'm really hoping we get to see them because I've never met this spider before and it's always a really special moment for you when I get to meet a, a, a new arachnid. Great, so what are we gonna look for? We're at this wall, what are we looking yeah. for? Yeah, so there's kind of two general groups of spiders, ones that build webs and ones that don't. Today we're looking for a spider that does build a web. They, they build this radiating spiral on the outside surface which is what they use to feel things walking by and catch their food. And when you say tube, you mean like a tunnel like that a they're tunnel. building? Yeah, it's right, a tunnel. okay, a tunnel in the wall? Yeah, it goes into the wall. So we're just gonna see the opening mm -hmm. and then the kind of outer web, which is what they're using to sense things that are walking by. And so that's what we're looking for. We're looking for these webs that are giving us hints that there's a spider living there. Oh, Sebastian, I think I found one. Oh. Okay. It's the tiniest of tunnels. Whoa. Can you see it? Yeah, it's at the base of this like itty itty bitty little plant that's like just barely got its roots inside the wall. And I think I spotted legs. Oh, that means that this is inhabited. Yeah. I'm peering in, just trying to look as far as I can into this wall and I think I just saw some legs scurry away when they felt the breath from me talking and you're right it is it looks like a tunnel it's yeah not that i didn't believe you but <laughs> their web is perfectly shaped like a tunnel yeah it's like really round yeah on the outside. and then they're tucked in really far in there really far in it really feels like a cave out of like a fantasy story or something but just very tiny actually it's here this okay all right so here's some sign you see this web out here? Yeah. There's a bunch of little little bits of junk in there. Yeah. If you look a little closer, these are actually little bits of insect exoskeleton. Like the shell of... Yeah, the shells. It's leftovers, basically. Yeah, the stuff that they don't want to eat, all the hard bits. And I think, based on the size of these, there might be an adult nearby because I see some little beetle bits. Is that the big adult? Ooh. I just noticed another, like a ladybug yeah. Oh shell. yeah, yeah, there's a ladybug wing there. And you see how the there's web kind of spread outside the opening mm -hmm. here? Mm -hmm. That's a, as they grow, they'll develop more and more web on the outside instead of just at the entrance. Okay, I'm gonna try to deploy my secret spidering super weapon. Your what? What's the super weapon? Any guesses? <laughs> um, I don't know. It is an everyday tool that I think everyone listening to this podcast has at home. An everyday tool? Yeah. Oh, I can't think of an everyday tool that you can like use. You should at least once or twice a day. Your toothbrush? Toothbrush. Oh, wow. <laughs> How are you going to use a toothbrush to get a spider out? So, whenever you're working with an animal, you got to figure out what senses it uses mm -hmm. to understand the world. Mm -hmm. For most spiders, that's vibration. And so they use vibration to feel what's going on around them. And the right. webs just help them extend that sense from just next to their body to further away. 
and what they're looking for is the feel of something stuck or walking on that web. Right. And it turns out that a lot of electric toothbrushes vibrate at a similar enough rate as bugs flap their wings. No way. That you can sometimes trick a spider to come out and think that there's food. Yeah, the electric toothbrush is the, is the more accessible option. <laughs> but I do know many scientists that have had to get very specific patterns of vibration to get their spiders to react. Right. Uh, which has led them to go to very specific adult entertainment stores because ah. very specific vibrators that have a certain pulsing Stop. pattern that the spiders are like, yes, that is it. Stop that is it. what gets me interested. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tape a little leaf or a feather if I can find it to the end of my toothbrush and then we're going to see if we can get the spider to come out. Yeah, so I'm just getting some tape off here and that's going to help me stick something to the end of it because maybe I don't want to put the bristles that I use to brush my teeth right on the web. That is fair enough. Let's try the stick. So you've, you've taped the twig to the back of the toothbrush, yeah. not to the bristles for all the people that are like <laughs> gritting their teeth yes, at the moment. <laughs> that are clenching their teeth. All right, and now I'm going to try. If this works out, the spider's going to come out and maybe try to uh, nibble at the twig because it's going to think it's food. So, here goes nothing. Sebastian is gently just rubbing the twig yep. in different... Yeah, this, it's possible that this web is not... Uh, currently inhabited, even though it once was. Oh, oh, oh <gasps> no. <gasps> it's coming out. <gasps> oh my goodness. <gasps> oh my <gasps> gosh. <laughs> oh, yeah. A, that is a very big spider. A spider's about maybe an inch in total body length. And it is very confused because it did try to nibble this twig and then realized it wasn't food. It was a toothbrush <laughs> that it came across. And is now going back in. So is this the tube spider that we were looking for? I think it might be, although the coloration of it was a little different. So it could be younger individual because some spiders change their colors as right, they grow, okay. or a different species that makes a similar web. But what the cool thing is I managed to get a photo. It means that we can try to identify them mm -hmm. using tools like iNaturalist. It had a really beautiful coloration, a yeah. nice, really dark head, and then... This kind of like yellow, brown markings on the abdomen. Yes. And you could see the, the chalicera, the fangs, were this shiny black with like actually some bristly hairs. Oh, and we, I even managed to get a picture of the eye pattern, which is really useful because when you talk about eye pattern, what does that mean? Yeah, so the cool thing about spiders is that most of them have eight eyes, mm -hmm. but the size, shape, and position of those eyes changes a lot in different families of spiders. Wow. So you can actually tell what kind of spider you're looking at by taking a deep, long look into its eyes and comparing it to all of the ones that we know about. I think that we're going to need to post the picture of the spider on your electric toothbrush for everyone to see because that was amazing. <laughs> I've got proof. Okay, Sebastian, you know what I'm going to ask you now. Did you look up the spider we found and was it the one that we were looking for? I have good news and I have bad news. The bad news is that it wasn't the tube web spider that we were looking for. Oh, what? I'm a little disappointed because I really, really <laughs> looked hard. But okay, what's the good news? The spider that we did meet is a really, really cool one. So it's a member of the lace weaver spiders. And the species that we met is native to the UK and they do some really, really cool things. It's this behavior called matrophagy, which is where the offspring eat their own mother. And I know that sounds really gruesome, but really it's the mother choosing to let herself be her children's first meal. <gasps> so lace weaver mothers, they do everything they can 
to keep their babies safe and give them the best chance at life. They watch over their egg sacs until they hatch. And when the babies do hatch, they stay in the mom's home for a while. In order to give her kids enough energy to grow really quickly, she lays kind of a, a buffet of unfertilized eggs mm -hmm. for the kids to eat. And after they have that, she communicates to her offspring that it's okay to approach her and to eat her. And she just sits calmly and lets them feed off of her. She passes away, but her babies can grow up a lot faster than they would have if they had to go out and immediately catch all their food. And that means more of them will have a chance to survive. She's making this like ultimate sacrifice for her family. That kind of made me well up. <laughs> I wasn't expecting this from spiders. It's really impressive. And you wouldn't ever know because it's all happening behind the scenes inside of their homes. But I mean, that wasn't the only cool thing that we saw. We saw the spider, mm -hmm. but we also saw a bunch of other animals. We saw beetles. We saw snails. We saw some really cool bumblebees flying around. Right. And we also saw really cool creeping plants growing in the walls and flowers coming out of like cracks and crevices. Yeah, we didn't put in a ton of effort going out to somewhere exotic. It only took a small amount of effort and we found amazing things. A small amount of effort and an electric toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to introduce someone on my side of the Atlantic, right here in the U.S., who loves to get out there and have his own safari experiences close to home. Eric Stone Street is probably best known for his role as Cameron Tucker in the TV sitcom Modern Family. But what you might not know about Eric is that he's also the voice of a number of popular animated animals, including the oversized mutt Duke in The Secret Life of Pets, and the nervous flying horse Minimus in Sophia the First. He told us a bit about why he enjoys playing the part of an animal and shared the story of a very special animal encounter of his own. The reason I was so excited to do Duke in The Secret Life of Pets was because I'm such a dog lover and have loved dogs my whole life and always had dogs in my life. So I thought it was a, a great opportunity for me to bring a little bit of my interpretation of a dog's mind to the character. You know, and with Sophia the First, the horse, the timidness of my character Minimus on that is uh, sweet by nature. And I love horses. I, they're like big dogs, actually. Their aptitude to learn is incredible. I definitely brought my love and experience for animals to those characters. <laughs> There's a pig called a babarusa. They're pretty creepy, they have yellow eyes and fangs. But again, I love, there's an empathetic quality that they bring out in me, which is here you look at this animal and think, ew, but yet they have a heart, a brain, and they need love too. So there would be a really cute uh, performance possibility playing a babarusa. I remember as a kid being in the woods, I always loved being in the woods and watching squirrels and watching, you know, animals. I remember when I was with a friend in college and we were camouflaged and uh, we were there documenting something for a friend of mine's class. And here comes this beautiful Kansas white-tailed deer. And you know, deer's vision is not as good as their overall sense, right? They know there's something there, but they don't know something's there. So they try to trick you. Well, this deer was probably, I would say 30 yards away and she kept putting her head down and then she'd look up real fast in my general direction. And just trying to trick me in that moment, but being that close and so personal, you realize the world and life is not just about us, right? There's so many things going on outside of where we live, where we eat, where we drink, where we drive our car in traffic, you know, all around us is nature. 
And that's why I love going into the woods and seeing the paths and seeing the different markings, the buck rubs and things like that, the droppings, and just know that if I wouldn't have been here, this deer still would have walked by, those squirrels still would have been playing on that sapling like a roller coaster. You know, they still would have been doing that and I'm just privileged enough to witness it and join them in their life. Wow, I absolutely love Eric's story about his encounter with the deer. It just reminds me of the power of immersing ourselves in nature, just sitting and watching. And it reminds me when I was at university and I was an undergrad vet student and one of our lecturers would always say, if you want to get to know a cow, just sit in a field and see what they do. I mean, obviously you mustn't trespass on anyone's land and you should stay at a safe distance at all times because getting close to cows can be really dangerous. But if you find a safe spot and do sit still, cows are really curious and they're like, why are you sitting there? What is your deal, human? Yeah. If you sit still and you start watching, you're going to be noticing all these cool behaviors. You're going to be immersed in that. Stay quiet, move slowly, and you'll start finding amazing stuff on your very own safari. My name is uh, Melissa Pons. I am a nature field recordist. I uh, went searching uh, for wolves in a uh, sanctuary in uh, Mafra in Portugal. Well, I tracked the wolves mostly by hearing them, not only uh, the howling, but they are so strong that when they run, like you really hear like the pouncing on the ground. Patience is, is key and, uh, you know, if you don't have patience, I don't think I can do anything. Uh, you really have to be there, sit on the ground and uh, just wait and hope for, for the best. I think it's a, only a very humbling experience because it's not about me, it's not about the recordist at all. You need to engage with uh, how these animals or how you know the wilderness around you moves. It's a magnificent animal in my opinion. It has uh, such noble qualities that I think I wish we also could learn from them. I was in awe with the way that they communicate. It's so immense that it's really impossible to, you know, to remain indifferent to it. Goosebumps experience, really. BBC Earth podcast was hosted by Rutendo Shackleton and me, Sebastian Echeverry. Our special reporter was Lucy Lapwing. The Wolves soundscape was provided by Melissa Pons. And our interview guest was Eric Stone Street. Our producers are Jeff Marsh and Rachel Byrne. Our researcher is Seb Masters. The podcast theme music was written by Axel Cacoutier and mixing and additional sound design was by Peregrine Andrews. The production manager is Catherine Stringer, and the production coordinator is Gemma Wooten. The associate producer is Kristen Kane, and the executive producer is Deborah Dudgeon. The BBC Earth podcast is a BBC Studios production for BBC Earth. <laughs>